You guys ready to listen? I love, this is one of my favorite talks. One, because I'm very passionate about it, but two, because it is really fun to give a talk on listening. Yeah, people go, what are you talking about? Listening, and everybody kind of cocks their head. Really, you're talking on listening? I'm like, yeah, I know, I get it. <laughs> so, but, so let me uh, give you the what happened and, and why I started this talk in the beginning. Um, it's really, if you guys were here on Tuesday, some of you may have been in, attended the Metrics Day with Alistair Kroll. And Alistair and I have been friends for quite a while. And he uh, called me up in, in January and said, I want you to talk at Startup Fest. What do you want to talk on? And I said, well, I said, you know, I do a lot on customer-centered development and leadership and innovation. And I'm happy to talk about any of that. And it's fun and I enjoy it. And we'll talk some creativity, stuff like that. And I said, but I have to tell you, I've been um, advising more. And uh, I, I am surprised at um, our lack of listening skills. <laughs> he said, so tell me, what do you mean? And I said, well, I said, I go and I advise people, and I've tried to be more. In the past, I would advise people, and it would be kind of off and on, um, and I'd come in when they need me, but I was being much more um, rigid in how, you know, talking to people every other week and going through things. And I said, I'm just surprised how often I come back, and people will proudly say, I did what you said, and then show me something, and it really wasn't what I said at all. <laughs> and, and I wasn't offended in the sense of, oh my gosh, they've done the wrong thing, or, you know, it was something awful. There were many, many times it was actually something wonderful, but it was more a point of fascination to me that, wow, I have actually been told I'm a very good communicator, and to realize with this kind of structure, I'm, I'm a scientist, so I, it was kind of a test for me, so I started testing my theory on this, and it was really fascinating to me how far off um, our listening skills are. So I actually started researching myself um, what kind of literature there is out there on listening, and I can tell you there's not much. Um, in the best, and I didn't go in and categorize everything, but in the best case, I would say that when we look at conversation literature, the best case, it's about a quarter of the conversation literature is actually on listening. Most of it is how to get our point across. And you definitely do get some things, you know, people talk about active listening, and there's um, some, you know, a little bit on that, and, and, you know, how to listen to understand, but it doesn't really go actually a little bit more back to the core of what causes us to uh, not listen. So I'm gonna cover a little bit of that today and I'm gonna cover some of the things that I've learned from listening and what helps us listen better. And I am one of those people that if you want to raise your hand and ask me a question in the middle, it doesn't bother me at all. So feel free to do that um, and otherwise I'm gonna save time in the, at the end. So I imagine that you guys have seen um, some cartoon like this in the past, right? This is about how you get building a product and why it turns out differently for everyone um, depending on who was listening to what the product was. So it's different for the ops people, it's different for customer service, it's different for the sales people, and it's different for, for the customer and what the customer wanted. And that really is the reason why I'm passionate about um, listening, is to try and help us build better products. That said, the feedback that I've gotten from this talk, and I've given it a few times now, is, wow, I've used this in meetings <laughs> to help in my regular daily life. So I will tell you, your mileage may vary, but please feel free and apply this across your life, not just talking to customers. I am gonna talk about it more in the customer-facing sense. So, the first thing problem. Uh, how many people have read Made to Stick? Chip and Dan, he highly, highly recommend it. So, um, they, you'll know this, and some people that haven't read the book may also know it. Uh, they covered in their book the um, tapping problem. It was a Stanford PhD thesis. And the problem was they had listeners and they had tappers. And the tappers were tasked with tapping out a song that everyone would know, Happy Birthday, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Whatever it is for you, tap out that song on the table and the listeners would guess what song it was. So they then asked the tappers, what percentage likelihood do you think 
that people will actually know what you tapped. And the listener said, you know, I get it. This is a really hard exercise and all. I give it 50-50. Does anybody remember what the actual answer was? How many times the listeners got it? 20%. 2.5%. So the listeners understood what the speaker said, 2.5%. Right? So they're using this as an example of how to communicate better, how to tap better, right? I want to help you guys listen better, how to hear that song. And what I will tell you is, think about that song metaphor, right? Your customers are tapping out to you, you're killing me softly. (laughs) And what happens when you hear another song in your head? How hard is it to hear the song that, you know, to come up with another song when you have a song playing in your head? You've all experienced that. Oh, what was that song? And you hear this background music and you can never come up with it. So you've got, we are the champions, right? (laughs) Playing in your head because you're passionate about the product that you're pursuing. How can you ever hear you're killing me softly? You can't. So I want to give you some tools to help drown out that music of your product in your head so that you can actually hear what customers are saying and respond to that. So there's the two, sorry, I didn't click well. 2.5%, another quote so you know that people retain just 25% um, and within 48 hours. So I'll give you some tips on that too, on how to uh, retain that. I do think, I will say that um, because you're not usually going in blind when you're talking to a customer, you usually have some contacts. I actually think we do better in general than 2.5%, but that's a pretty low bar. So. Um, Let's build some ear muscle together. It was fun finding pictures about ear muscle. Um, But these are actually, this is a Native American Eskimo um, Olympics, and they actually do have an ear pulling champion. So, I know. Aren't you glad you're not them? (laughs) We won't do that. So, one of the first things that I used to do, uh, so I um, founded Intuit's Corporate Innovation Lab many years ago. And I, as we talked about it, one of the things we would say in the lab is, you know, pretend you're from Missouri. Be from the show me state. And you guys may have heard things like that. Always ask, well, show me that you do that because people lie about what they do and they don't actually do it. And, And they say, oh, I log in every day. And then you go, oh, cool, can you show me that? And then they're like, oh, I don't remember my password. And you're thinking, well, if you log in every day, you probably do remember your password, so likely you don't actually log in every day, right? So what I've learned as I've gone through all of this is um, it's actually different. The show me state is different because the show me state is almost a challenge. It's like, oh, now you have to prove it to me. Where I want you guys to go is a curiosity state. So you've got to have that, that, you know, New York... Um, on the state is a state of mind. Um, I want you to go to that curiosity state of mind. And what curiosity does is Steve Jobs was described as being hyper curious, and it's one of the reasons that people claim he was successful. Um, I believe that. Um, people have said uh, that uh, Alan Klug, who, Aaron Krug, who is a Nobel Prize laureate. He actually said that curiosity was his secret weapon because every time something didn't work, he was curious why didn't it work. And that's what led him to the solution. So curiosity allows you to have an open um, mind to receiving new information rather than that challenge state of, well, show it to me and prove it to me that that's what you do. Curiosity is, you know, if someone says, well, I log on every morning. Oh, wow, really? You know, why do you log on every morning? What's important about that, right? And then you start going into it. You can still ask them to show you that, but you approach it from a very different perspective. So I'd like you, you know, if you remember, walk out of here with one thing, remember to approach it with curiosity. Curiosity is going to open your mind to possibilities, whereas show me or other techniques are not going to do that. So that's the first tip. Now, um, I'm going to stage this kind of in in, uh, customer segment. That's the biggest one that works in every um, part of a customer visit. Like I said, it doesn't just apply to customer visits. But specifically, before your customer visit, 
I'm going to ask you to give your brain context. And you guys have seen these um, pictures before in the past, right? They're all about perspective. And your brain also not only has a visual perspective, it ha also has an auditory perspective. And Anthony's going to help me out by uh, launching one. So listen to, to this. So what you'll hear is a sentence, a spoken sentence, that's been transformed by a computer to sound like gibberish. So, any idea what they say? No. Okay. Uh, you can hear it one more time. Okay, now we'll hear the real sentence. The Constitution Center is at the next stop. Does the Constitution Center sense that time? Yeah, wait, was that the same? Sentence you heard the first time. No way. <laughs> Your brain is always using prior information to make sense of new information coming in. So once you know what the sentence is, when you go back and hear the distorted version, you can apply that information and it makes sense. <laughs> so what you'll hear is a sentence, a spoken sentence, that's been transformed by a computer to sound like gibberish. So. Thank you, Anthony. So the, the clicker wasn't working on it, so we went the, the manual way. Um, so, so the point there is, of course, get some context of, on your client. Understand, are you going to see the finance person? What is the type of company that's there? Anything that you can do to give your brain some of that context will help you translate from gibberish, right, what you just heard, into something real and actual and help you understand. So approach it with curiosity, and then give yourself some, some, um, some context. And that context, the cool thing about that is, it will also encourage your curiosity. Because you'll start thinking, wow, I wonder if I was that person, how I would approach that. So they feed on each other. So the next uh, exercise that I have for you is, two, you've heard the saying, you have two ears and one mouth, use them in proportion that way, right? So this is a learning that we had at Intuit. Um, when we started the lab, we went out on a lot of the customer visits. Intuit's famous for their follow me homes. And uh, so we went out and we just started doing follow me homes. It's actually um, started by Scott Cook. Was, he believed in it from his work at P&G. And Scott, when I came in to do the lab, he said, you know, I just don't feel like we're, we're doing as well as we could have with our, our follow me homes. And so he said, I'd love to know your feedback on what's going on there because the company's very dedicated to it, we care about them, and we want to do a good job. And so um, I went on a few of these visits, and I said, well, the challenge is that we are doing in-person surveys. Um, so people were going in and had gotten into, in general, a, a cadence of coming in with about 95 questions, and they were rushing through these visits to make sure they wrote down everything and make sure that every question was answered. And it's an easy thing to do, right? You go, man, I don't want to forget this, and the engineers asked me to do this, and our UX person wanted this. And so you start adding on everybody's questions to make sure that you don't leave anything out. And the challenge with that becomes, it becomes a very, very expensive survey because you're spending your time just answering questions rather than exploring and finding the surprises. And what Scott would tell you, which I also believe, is the innovation comes in the surprises. And that kind of questionnaire won't give you those surprises. And you need to, this is where the curiosity comes in, right? This is where the open mind comes in because you need to be open and ready to, for that. And once you hit a surprise, rather than throwing it away, you need to take that surprise and embrace it. And that's likely where you're going to find the innovation. Innovation doesn't come from common sense. Well, somebody else would have found it a long time ago. So that's why we would say you have two hours. We, we generally did three hours or more. And you can ask three questions. So you can't come in with uh, your list of 95 questions. You can come in with three, which you can imagine then how high level those questions are to start getting an idea and a framework. Do you have you a question? Have, yeah, you have to be careful how much context you give your brain so it's not pretty biased. 
Absolutely, absolutely. It's, um, it's a delicate balance there because, again, if you don't come in, just like with that brain, if you don't come in with enough, and by that I mean learn more about them and their business, which you usually don't have the background on, um, so you're likely not going to become an expert in, um, you know, assembling kits or something like that. So that's the level. I think that's a great point is the level. Think about it at the, at the three question level too. Don't go and read eight papers by them, but do go in and understand who I'm coming in to talk to, what kind of business they're in, what role that they're in, what their background is so that you have some context in it. Again, it's not to form um, biased opinions on that. It's really to give your, your brain some context so you can see that different perspective. Um, the next thing before your visit that I always recommend is pause. If you know how to meditate, I actually would recommend that. So you get there, you're rushed, you're checking um, your phone, and you're saying, oh, I got this email and all of this. And you start putting a lot of things into your brain which don't allow you to listen. So get there 10 minutes early. Sit in your car. You know how to meditate. Do it because that helps you open your mind to new things. But even if you don't, pause. Take some time to clear your mind. Don't even think about the customer visit. Don't worry about the questions you're going to ask. Clear your mind. To think about what's going on at work, say, I'm going to center myself, and I know what I'm here to do, and what I'm here to do is have an open, clear mind so that I can listen to exactly what the customer said. So always hit pause before you start and get all the worries off the table. So during your chat with the customer, also, when I mention this, I talk about, you know, when you get to the customer, this can happen before if you're on the phone with them. So don't get too tied up in, this is the, like I said, I'm, I'm used to doing the follow me homes because I'm an intuit person um, in my heart and in my soul. And uh, I, I would, I love to go out and visit customers, but don't let that hold you back. Don't let the fact that you don't feel like you can go out and meet with customers hold you back from talking to them. This will work whether you're on the phone with them, whether you're doing a text chat with them. I promise the same kinds of things and discipline will work for that. So during your chat, how many people know Humans of New York? Yeah, I've got quite a bit there. So um, the guy who does, oops. Um, the guy who does Humans of New York has a, a great video online. And it's all about how he gets people to reveal the crazy things that he reveals. So if you don't know Humans of New York, he actually goes around with a camera. He's just a regular guy, loves photography. He actually goes around with a camera in New York City, approaches people and says, hey, can I take your picture? And they let him. And then he gets them to tell him these crazy things that you would never imagine they would tell a person who, who they just met on the street. And so um, this video was all about how do I get people to reveal their innermost secrets to me within a matter of minutes when I'm also taking their picture. So if, you, if he can do that in that type of situation and get them to reveal a lot about themselves, I promise you can do it in three hours with the customer, right? And his, this is, these are his tips. It's about the energy. It's how you approach it. And again, that energy for your customer visit is all about openness. It's about you showing that you're interested in them, not just, hey, I want an answer from you, and that's what I'm here for, and I want to write it down. It's really about how you're approaching to, hey, I really want to learn from you. That's an energy that you approach it with. It's your approach. He actually, I love this because it's a physical approach for him. He's a tall guy. So he'll actually, as he comes to approach someone, he'll actually kind of bend down, which looks a little weird, but he says it works, you know, because if he's coming in and he's looming over someone, that people step back and they don't like it. So he actually just kind of, you know, casually goes down and, you know, can I take your picture? <laughs> he says if someone's sitting on a bench, he'll actually go sit on the ground next to them. And that's one of the things that he does, but I love that example because it really shows you how the physicality makes a difference as well. He explains himself. He always has a copy of his book to say, you know, hey, this is me, this is who I am. 
he doesn't go into a lot of detail, though, which I think is interesting. He's like, you know, hey, I take pictures, and it's, you know, all about the people of New York and showing that we're humans and we're, you know, individuals. And so he doesn't go into a very long description, but he does have a short one, and he has some credibility behind him. So the example I'll give from Intuit on that is um, we were often, and many people will, accept customer visits from you because they want customer support. Uh, so <laughs> what we had in the lab was we had a process that we would say, you know what, even if we did know how to use the software, we didn't use that time for that. And we would say to them, you know what, we're not the experts in the software, which we weren't. We're not the experts in sport support, which we weren't. I'm going to take down your questions, and I'm going to get a support person to call you within the next day. And then we organized it with our support team that someone would call them. So this way, the person that wanted to get their questions answered could, and you could go on with your visit. So that's where I would say in this, our explain yourself was make sure they understand what you're there for, but don't turn your back on them if they need help. So we did that as well. Figure out some of the processes that you have for that. The other thing is escalate slowly. And this definitely applies in customer visits as well. If you're so focused on your one vision, you're gonna miss a lot. I talk, I talk about it as seeing around the product. You're gonna miss some opportunity for innovation there if you don't start at that high level and then drill down. So really think about that when you come up with your three questions, not to be even too, you can be high level there, but really go up a few, a few levels to make sure that your, um, seeing things that are around what you're thinking about building, not just the specific area that you're working on. So, wow, I'm being crazy with this clicker today. So, this is a question that I get asked all the time. You know what, I really need to type my notes because that's the way I share it with the team. So, I was actually biased against keyboards, I will tell you. Um, and I didn't really know why, except that I saw it distracting people. So someone would be taking notes, and the tapping absolutely distract, distracts the customer. So you're taking them out of their rhythm. Um, so that was my reason that I didn't have any scientific proof. I now, thank goodness, thank you for the internet, have scientific proof. Um, regardless of your handwriting, which this is my handwriting, you can see how bad it is. Um, it's actually, you comprehend better when you uh, write versus typing. And anybody that doesn't know egg freckles, just <laughs> type in egg freckles in Doomsbury, and you'll see a great uh, cartoon that was one of the seminal ones when the uh, Apple Newton released. And it's, it's beautiful. Um, but it's, it's all about the handwriting recognition. So the studies show that um, you actually comprehend and remember both better if you write rather than type. That's regardless of whether you actually go back and study your notes in either case. So they've gone through, and this has actually been extensively tested now, um, and it was done with students and their learning capabilities, and what they learned is that they always perform better both on comprehending, and the belief is there's two things that trigger it, because they actually went back and tested they told the people that were typing not to type verbatim. Um, so that was one of the things that they learned is that uh, people who are writing out would, would um, summarize points better, and that's how the comprehension was higher. Um, and, and they understood it because they had to do that mental uh, um, gymnastics to actually understand it better. But even when they told the people that were typing, to do that same thing, like don't type verbatim, summarize the notes as you're typing. Um, there's something with the physicality of writing it out in your brain and how your brain stores information. They don't actually know that yet, what it is, but um, they have proven it in repeated results. I'm assuming that doesn't apply to people with dysgraphia or typing is actually passed away. Absolutely. I mean, if you have, this was testing folks that, that knew, um, that were able to, had the capabilities. Uh, so if you can't, if there's some reason that you can't type, I wouldn't say that illegible handwriting is a reason not to write though. That's the one that uh, people most often use. No one can understand my handwriting. Um, so they did some tests even where um, people that were 
writing out notes would then go and type what they learned later and use those as study guides and they also performed better. So you actually really do comprehend better if you can write um, and because of uh, just the way your brains are wired. Um, are we? I'm, I'm frozen, Anthony. Oh, there we go. Okay. <coughs> there we go. Um, so, your brain, we speak, the fastest speakers speak about 125 words per minute. And uh, your brain can process at over 400 words per minute. So when we sit there and think, oh my gosh, I'm distracted, gosh, I can't pay attention, I've got so much going on, it's actually because um, there's no way that a speaker can speak as fast as uh, you can understand. So your brain is like a cheetah, and our speaking ability is like Usain Bolt, who's very fast, but he's not as fast as a cheetah, right? So there's things that you can do to help um, help your cheetah brain stay engaged rather than going off to other topics when the speaker speaks slowly. And I speak more slowly than most because I'm from the South. So uh, tips that they have for people, predict the next points um, that the speaker's gonna say. And it's not that you're right or wrong, it's because you're really thinking and engaging in the information. Note supporting points. Gosh, when she said that it was a cheetah brain, what things did she say to support that? Well, gosh, she gave us this information that we can process it at 400, over 400 words per minute, right? So, so write some of that down so that you're organizing the, the supporting points and you actually start to know and learn better. Give your mind something to do that's in context of the um, actual visit. So the next thing, and you guys got a preview of this because I can't click correctly, um, boomerang your brain. So you're going to get distracted because I just told you how much faster our brains process than, you can, than we can speak. So one of the things to do is clear the distractions because most of us will go in with a notebook that we've had for a while and there's sticky notes, a piece of there, you have your phone on it, vibrates. You start thinking about that. Make sure that you have your, your, um, all of those distractions out of the way when you go into the customer visit. Even little things that you wouldn't think of, you'll notice them and your brain will take off for that because it's looking for anything to do that. So if you notice yourself getting by, caught by distraction, again, realize that's a distraction and bring your brain back. You actually, um, they, they've proven that the more you do that with your brain, the more you bring your brain back, the more often you will. So once you start noticing one distraction, you're gonna notice the next distraction faster. So really train your brain to pick up on those and you'll get much better at coming back. Find visual cues. So if it's something about the person who's talking and you feel yourself getting distracted, go back to the tie that they have on or the sweater and and always go back to that. So this was a, a result that they did in some testing with driving, that even people who uh, would get, you know, they were on long haul driving trips, they would actually just tie a string around the top of the steering wheel, and when they felt themselves getting distracted, they would look back at the string, and that helped their attention span, and to stay focused on the, the, manner, the matter of driving. Um, I said play a game, and I was going through this talk with Chip Heath, uh, and I, I was asking him for feedback on it, and he said, you shouldn't play, I, I was suggesting buzzword bingo, uh, <laughs> so that uh, as you know, people said things, well, do buzzword bingo, and he said, actually, don't do that, because um, he said it's, that's a complex process to do something like buzzword bingo, and he said that you would, that would actually distract you too much. So I put that in there so that you guys know when you think about things like that, come up with something simple, like the string on the steering wheel. So keep that simple. Anytime you're having a problem, feel free to take a break. And we would do this all the time. You know, you find yourself starting to nod off and you've tried to bring yourself back several times and you're not. It's like, hey, cool, can we just see that warehouse you talked about? You know, what, what was in, you know when we walked in, we saw that room over there and it seemed like some people, what were they doing? Get up and walk around. Your brain really responds well to physical activity 
it helps you get back into a rhythm. So absolutely stand up and take a break. Don't feel stressed from that. That's going to help you listen better. And even if you take a 10-minute break there, you're going to make up for it the next time uh, you sit down to talk. So um, summary, I really tried very hard to come up with a, a, you know, an acronym for this. Um, I did like CC3PR. <laughs> Because it made me laugh. <laughs> um, and then you guys remember that. So that's just me being silly. Um, so, oh, yeah, sorry, I added this on. Um, so actually listening, where do I find the time? This is the biggest question that I get asked. They're like, okay, this is cool, I can do this, that's great. I don't have the time to do that. Um, I promise you, oh, sorry, How, where do I find the time? I think I'm missing a graphic there. Sorry about that. Um, you find the time, you guys, actually this is easy for Lean Startup, I don't even need a graphic. You guys find the time because you don't do the wrong thing, right? How much time does it take you to fix the wrong thing? A lot more than it does take you to do it the right, the first time. So that's where you're going to find the time is by not screwing up. Um, how do I find customers? We did this, we were talking about Germany. Um, we did this for, I um, ran a German company for a while, we would go to the beer garden. And I promise you, my, my German friends are here in the front. Uh, the Germans thought I was insane when I told them. I was like, just take a computer and go to the beer garden, buy a beer, and it'll be great. And they're like, there is, there is no way. We are not approaching people in a beer garden. That's, you know, sacrosanct. You can't do that. This is work. That's fun. No. And I heard all of it. And I'm like, will you please just go do it? And so they you know, said, oh, the crazy American, she has these weird ideas. And, and they, but they went and did it because they thought I was strange. I don't know, for some reason they did. And, uh, and they loved it because they got way different information than they had ever gotten before. It wasn't a usability lab. It was just, hey, I'm going out and hanging out with people. And they were surprised at how many people wanted to give information. They were like, cool, what is this Spreadshirt thing? What do you mean I could build a t-shirt online? I didn't even understand that. And they would get in great conversations and then people would start playing with the product. You don't have to have a product, and we did because we were already at that stage. I've had people that go to Starbucks and actually have things just drawn out, right? You can go on a trade show floor. If you need to have specialized people, you're not just looking at general consumers, trade show floors are great places to do that. Find out. Whoever it is that you're selling to, find out their trade and go to a trade show like that and just walk around, walk up to booths and say, hey, you're a marketing person. What do you think of this? It's crazy what people will spend time with you on. It really is nuts. You think like I'm intruding on them and they're like, wow, someone's listening to me. And if you're really listening, they're going to love you even more. So. Um, there are national records for the strongest years. <laughs> you can do things like pull helicopters. I didn't know this. <laughs> but there is actually, with your ear, why <laughs> is my question. But I know you guys could set records that don't hurt as much as this do, that are actually less pain rather than more pain. So go off and check the set records. I am happy to be your coach. I'm on Twitter, and I'm on email, and I'm very happy to talk to you about it because I love this topic of listening. So there. Yes. Um, one of the things that you didn't mention was during the conversation, paraphrasing them. These are the old things you used to hear about. Are you really listening? Paraphrase what they said, or maybe ask them, leave, not leave, but ask them questions about what they said, things like that. Yeah, I, I would ask them questions rather than paraphrasing. And, and people, um, it's a bias thing. People will more normally say, yeah, that's close enough. And you don't want close enough. You want So, so asking questions and those open-ended questions tends to be better than just repeating back what they're saying. So, and questions are great. I mean, it's not, you know, pausing is really good too. A lot of people, pausing allows you to process what they were think, what they were saying and think about those notes that you were taking and then ask a question from that right. is usually a great idea. Yes. You talked about taking notes by hand. Uh, do you have any experience taking mind map style notes? Is more, being more effective, less effective? 
I don't, there, I, I did look at, it's a great question because there's a lot of people that like to draw and I, I did look to um, try and see if there had been any research on visual, whether it was mind mapping or anything visual and there really hasn't been any research done on visual versus just handwriting. Um, my guess is it depends on the person and that, you know, that, that could be just the way you are, are you a more visual person and that's how you actually store those memories or not, are you just, you know, is that more comfortable? So, and I, I would guess it also depends on distraction level, too. But I hope that there's some, some I have a whole bunch of research projects I want to start from that. Mm -hmm. There's a question? Um, so, so we, uh, so we're doing. I'll give you just a short overview. We're doing um, neuroscience-based artificial intelligence. So I say we're bringing real intelligence to artificial intelligence. <laughs> it's a quick version, and um, we do have some visual mapping to help people understand their data. Uh, what we focus more on on the customer side is their customers, um, whoever that is. And so when we're looking at it from learning from the customer, we're really pushing them to understand their customer more, which is how we can um, help with our software and, and the modeling better on that. 